nuts. He does it all the time, too. He'll be like, did you see those guys? I'm like, what are you talking about? The other he, thing is, he's, he doesn't know that that doesn't I know. Work, Nobody I does. like him so much. All right, you guys ready? Right do you know what else? I Do you know that, what? that giving Mara a compliment makes her mad? It does. Did you know that? It yeah. doesn't. If you do, Don't be if rude you to ever like are that. nice, if you are ever nice to her, or maybe it's a gender thing, if a man, it, it's, it, she just wants to She goes you. for him? Yeah, she is offended. All right. Here we go. Can Beware. everyone hear each other? Beware. Beware. <laughs> All righty, guys, it is on convention eve. It is April 26th in the great state of Utah. Greg Hughes, Mara Carabello, and Heidi Hatch here from KUTV2 News. And guess what, guys? We've been talking about this forever, but forever. we are recording actual video. Is this that new on? Invention. Is that on? Is this on? I'd tap it, but it's far away. Can't we so. wave? Are we waving? You're yes. not. Oh, you're showing. What are you wearing? Do you want to tell people shirt. about this your my, outfit? This is my fight of the century. Mm, you look classy. Right? Madison Square Garden, 1971. This commemorates the... Ali Frazier fight, That's which cool. was nice, where Frank Sinatra could not get a ticket, so he went in his press with the, as a photographer and was ringside as a photographer because he couldn't get a seat. The you know the chairman Frank Sinatra yeah, couldn't yeah. get a ringside. It's that big of a fight. Ali got knocked down. Ali lost the fight. Everybody thought that he would beat Joe Frazier. Yep. It's his first fight and you back. You got the t-shirt, and I got the shirt because tomorrow is going to take the place. Of the fight of the century as the great is the fight of the century. Tomorrow's this is convention, your convention Eve is the fight of the century. Oh, look at you even looking into the camera there. Yeah, I dramatic. Little, I feel like little, I have to turn this way. Little, 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 <laughs> and just so you know, it, for people who are listening just audio only, we'll be posting this on YouTube, but this room gets warm too. So if you see people's sweaters coming off or fans <laughs> out, we haven't figured out the air conditioning yet. But we're glad uh, to bring in a larger audience that really wants to see what Greg's wearing and what Mara's wearing. <laughs> Mara's really the, the fashion forward um, member of this Fashionista. podcast. Yeah, I'm yeah she a is. Relaxed I usually have yeah. glasses so I can actually see all Yeah, this, both of us forgot our glasses. For, but for reading, the record, I didn't tell anyone we were going to be on camera. So this was right. one of those days where you just get a surprise. So yeah. here we go. We have a lot to talk about. I want to start with the state GOP convention. Last week, I thought we'd already talked about everything to be talked about. But I feel like in the last couple of days, they've gone wild. Yes, parts are shaking and moving. So the first thing that really kind of surprised me was yesterday. I was on Twitter right before the newscast. And I saw an endorsement come from Senator Mike who's been um, very loud in the recent weeks about opposing uh, some of the funding for the Ukraine bill and um, a few other things. And he also said that he was really going to be finding some fiscal conservatives to come to Congress. And then comes this endorsement where instead of endorsing his peer in the congressional district in Utah in CD2 and newly elected Celeste Malloy, he has decided to go with a newcomer and challenger, Colby Jenkins, saying, quote, too many Republicans have voted to expand the size and scope and cost of the federal government. So I was surprised by this. Were either of you surprised, or is this what you were expecting to happen? Uh, and no, it's it's an unexpected move. On convention move. eve. Well, it's an unexpected move in that uh, – you don't, you don't usually see that where you, you have a Washington delegation, two uh, incumbents from the same party, and then you'll see an endorsement for a challenger. Uh, but it's, but I will tell you that, that Senator Lee has been particularly frustrated as of late. Uh, you have a minority of the Republicans in the House that are just really teaming up with the Democrats to push things to the Senate. And I think that uh, he's been very critical nationally, uh, but you've not heard him or seen him as strong uh, in that space here in the state, and I think this was a big move. It's a it's a it's a brave move, and um, and I I don't know that we can keep going the same trajectory. So I think that this vote it's not a coincidence that just Tuesday night is when it passed the Senate uh, this big spending yeah. foreign aid spending bill, and you're seeing uh, Senator Lee make some of these decisions now. I think that I think they're related, and I I think he's worried about the trajectory thirty four trillion in debt and. How, how are we going to how are we going to do any better than what we're doing and now? And so when he's worried about that as the sitting senator, mm -hmm. he should place his own vote. What I was disappointed with no, is No, they don't that, they don't influence any of that. No, I mean, but what I was disappointed with is that uh, he's putting his finger on the scale. He could have taken a pass on this. Yeah. And if he cared about it from a policy point of view, I think you would have seen him come out with an endorsement earlier. When it's this last minute, Lee right now is capital P politics. He is an obstructionist. 
perfectionist. He doesn't want to get things done. He wants to win political battles. He doesn't care if we're in gridlock. All of the problems that, that Greg outlined are true, but to criticize someone for actually passing a bill in Congress, I mean, come on. So it was so, it's so interesting. He's yeah, clearly it's... told the rest of his delegation that he doesn't care if he plays well in the sandbox. He doesn't care if they suffer. It's all sort of about his um, positioning and his branding and him being a hardline politician. Because, mm. like, he's he's sort of really perpetuating that it's we're going to tilt at windmills here. We're going to stand by our politics. It's, it's not it's not saber-rattling. It's but, for the reasons you say that he well, I mean, wants I, to see I things pass, is. that he's making these very bold yeah. and, 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 frankly, uncomfortable decisions, but decisions he thinks has no, no, to be no, made. No, 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 no. He can make those in his own thing. He, what he did but is you start act like to nobody put his endorses. finger on the scale So, so Celeste Malloy has, has endorsements, you know. She does. And yeah. she has some that were announced right. just yesterday. Right. So that is that so too late that, that George, Jim Jordan power, endorsed let's talk about the power uh, of the Celeste Malloy? The power was of the that endorsement. too late? So I think we both agree that endorsements matter and don't. Um, yeah. Mike Lee is unique in that the, he is a darling, as we all say, With of delegates, the delegates. specifically. Delegates yeah. love him. And, and, and the other thing election, that our listeners already know be. is Malloy uh, doesn't have signatures. So this particular race will be fought at conventions yes. and um and you know i say to everyone listening please gather signatures what the heck like i think that that putting the decision in so few of hands is not in the best interest of utah so but she rolled those dice and mm -hmm. so she'll go in tomorrow and remember she's got to you know both of them actually because they could both send themselves to a primary but what makes this interesting is what's the impact well i think if you go in decided an endorsement of anybody's mm -hmm. doesn't make a difference. So we're only talking about those who have who go into convention tomorrow undecided. And may not be sure. Yeah. yeah. And the interesting uh, thing when you look at this, too, is Senator Lee doesn't have a race of his own this year. And so he's inserting himself into the politics of what's happening right now and making sure he still has a voice. How much of a voice, we don't know. Uh, Greg, you know that conventions can be hard sometimes, and you never yes. know what's going to happen. I talked to a lot of people who thought that you were going to come out on top in this same race. I was race. one of them. I thought that, that Celeste too. Malloy was, really was going to win. You were like, things. I, I think really he's going to win. Yeah. So I... I will be interested to see what happens at convention tomorrow. And uh, luckily for all the convention goers, it's going to be nasty weather. So if you want to stay inside and yeah. fight it out all day long, you can do that. So, so what's so fun about conventions, especially from when you get when you get to view them, but yet and you get to do color commentary instead of live and die by their yeah, every decision. It is more fun. Though. It is a lot more fun right now to just watch and observe. But if you're privy, you don't have to poll likely voters. You can ID the guaranteed voters, which is such a different, know who they are. which is such a different a version of information than than polls. Yeah. Well, when you see when you see these voter IDs of state delegates, I just think that, and I think things are still in flux. I think there's a lot of movement. Um, there's a lot of uh, peaking, and there's a lot of people that are their momentum is either slowing or it's gaining right now. I, I think tomorrow's going, I think, yeah, Saturday's going to be a, a really exciting convention. The yeah. other wild card is I, I think that delegates are savvy enough to sometimes game the system. So sometimes you don't know where they Certainly. stand. There's some trickery going yeah, on. Yeah, and I mean, in they a good way. They don't know who's asking in, them, in a so nice they'll, old, they'll Yeah, in a good old-fashioned way. Um, the Salt Palace is where the Republicans are. Cottonwood yeah. Heights is where the Democrats are. And we understand, so the... Eight to nine, nine to ten, first two hours are for the House and Senate races, the state House and Senate races that haven't been decided. Starting at 1030 is the regular convention. And Rob Axum is saying that he does believe you will still get out and there'll be technically daylight. So he's telling us that's like, so like 7.30 8 or 5. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, keep that in mind. If you visit it's, the Republicans, bring a power bar and yeah, some it's, caffeine. It's, it's lost. I mean, you have the governor's race. You've got this U.S. Senate race. You've it's got the two platform. gubernatorial races. All your you've got, craziness you've got, yeah. on the platform. And just talking about Democrats for one second, since you brought them up, um, We'll talk more about them as we get to the general election. But I saw an interesting tweet from the Young Democrats yesterday taking down uh, one of the candidates there saying that he was supporting um, RFK Jr. and that he was not who the party was. And so they were saying, let's get rid of him. I meant to put that in our show notes and I forgot it. But there's interesting politics They're going on on both sides. sounds very intolerant. My, I'm very surprised. My Democrats house race has a competitive primary tomorrow. Although Which both, one is it? They've both gathered House District Twenty Three. They've both gathered signatures, oh. so you know. So yeah. it's, it's Brian King's. No it's what? Brian King's open seat because yeah. Brian King is running for as the governor's candidate for the Democrats. Yeah, yeah. and I want to talk about uh, the governor's race for right 
for a minute here because there's going to be interesting things going on. It seems to me, and maybe I'm only just starting to pay attention as we get close to convention, but Phil Lyman uh, seems to be gaining some traction and also fundraising. We saw Brian King earlier this week tweet and said that he out fundraised the governor in this last quarter. And then we saw the same thing, a tweet coming from Phil Lyman. I looked up their numbers and while well, the governor still has more money than both of them, uh, there is some serious fundraising going on outside of the governor right now. I pulled up um, Phil Lyman's numbers, and he currently has his ending balance at 638000 uh, But his total contributions, which I think were from this quarter, 825000 That's So good. he's mm, pulling yeah. in some money. Uh, Brian King still obviously behind the governor, but had a better quarter fundraising. Does this mean anything, or it just was a quarter, and it just is going to add up and so, um, say know, There was a year uh, when, when Gary Herbert ran against Jonathan Johnson. Uh, Gary Herbert, the longtime governor at that point, uh, got 45% of the delegate vote, and, uh, and Jonathan Johnson got 55%. Uh, that, that was that was a surprise at the time, but when you got to the got to the primary, it wasn't uh, competitive at all. Uh, Governor Herbert won every single county, all twenty nine. So, so you know, th- there's a lot. I think there's there's good stock to put into the momentum coming out of a convention, uh, but it doesn't obviously it doesn't decide everything. I will say, I think candidates are starting to get a little more savvy. You're seeing television. You're seeing o- they call it OTT because we stream a lot of television now, so you can target commercials yeah. to neighborhoods and areas a little bit better than before. So, uh, if you can start your, your if you feel confident enough and you can start that primary cycle while you're in your convention cycle, and then you can take momentum from that convention. I do think there's uh, something to be said there. I think Phil Lyman's fundraising numbers are, are robust. That is not a candidate that's just uh, more of a fringe candidate when you're able to raise that kind of money. So that's an exciting – again, I like fighters make fights. I think everybody benefits, especially when I'm not the candidate that has to suffer through it. Everybody uh, benefits from a, a good, robust, difficult race. I think it brings out the best and can bring out the best in everyone. Yeah, and I'm feeling kind of guilty about my answer here because I really want to celebrate. This is a Brian guilt-free King's. room. I like I I love that he's making hay of that. I love the Phil Lyman. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not a Phil Lyman supporter, no. but I'm I'm with Greg. I kind of like fights, and I like to see it coming out. The, the bummer part of it is, yeah, I don't think it means anything. But I want to <laughs> I want to like leave that for another day. Yeah. I want to just be in the moment. And the other kind of tricky part about this, um, particularly when we talk about this cycle, nobody could raise anything because of the legislative session that all three of them there were involved in. There was a huge in. pause, yeah. And the reality is I just don't think Governor Le- or uh, Governor Cox asked anybody for money. Like, I, I don't think this is indicative of anything, but having said that, I just don't want to take the headline away from Brian King. Yeah, high Good five. job. Well done. Right? Um, and so it'll be interesting, and I do love having contested races, even if you have someone that you believe is going to win. I think, as Greg said, it's important to have the conversation, hold each other accountable, and uh, yeah, I think we it's a good we thing just for voters. Need coronations, honestly. We just don't need people that are just the presumptive winner, well, and we don't I'm care. Sorry. We're just gonna. Can I amend your Republican <laughs> statement? We a just job. don't need coronations for the primary because I think you all are doing a <laughs> heck of a good job coronating for the November election. So, like, before you're hey, on, no like, one's coronating. You just got to build a party over there. Oh, please! And by the way, let's I don't know if you've noticed that party right now, but you're you're context. it's coming apart now. Brian King is your former colleague. I, I, no, he's building the party. He's doing what a Democrat does. And he's does. done a great job. Two years ago, yeah. everybody was bailing yeah. out of their party. So they want to go with McMuffin because they didn't want to. They didn't think they could win. I'll I love con- that. Brian. I'll consider you undecided then. I think Brian is doing a very good job, Representative King, of uh, being serious about it. And I think that's the only way you're going to get a strong two-party system. And I don't. I think that is good for the system than everybody filing into one party because practically it seems yeah. to be the way to get elected. And I should mention as we're going in uh, in the governor's race that gubernatorial candidate Carson Jorgensen, who we know was leading the party for a year, uh, picked Utah Parents United co-founder Corinne Johnson as his running mate. So he's coming out trying to see mm-hmm. if that might uh, shore him up a little bit at convention. Does it at all? Uh, no. Yeah, no. I mean, it's more of his brand. But may I ask uh, Citizen Hughes, insider yes. to the convention, yes, question? So I I hear tell that uh, Deidre Henderson, so part of the process <laughs> is yes. to have your lieutenant governor slot confirmed 
um, by by the delegates. Mm-hmm. I hear tell that there might be something afoot with hers. Good eye. Who, who, what little bird told you this? Because this, Is this true? Is there I an open race she's looking to run no, for? No, I wasn't omitting this detail, but I didn't remember. And it is actually a significant detail. Omission, so, um, that's still a lie for us. Still, if, you're, if, if, if you know a, that a you should be telling us. Yes, I yes, didn't sand. remember. I did not remember this part, but this is actually really, really important. So... I, I was surprised to see it on the agenda, the ratification of lieutenant governor candidates. Right. Okay? Um, it's on the agenda. It's printed. And I don't remember. I ran, and I had a lieutenant governor uh, pick. Yeah. And I don't remember a delegate being needing the delegates to, to You're approve You're sometimes it. all about yourself, though. Yeah. Maybe I missed it. But <laughs> So what do um, we read into no, this? No, but here's no, – so let me just get quicker on this. So uh, this – it is – it has been the case. Uh, it has been more perfunctory in the past, mm-hmm. but there is because of uh, Deidre Henderson's involvement in some of the other races in terms of contributing to races or being on a finance committee of another uh, statewide candidate. That, that was for A.G. Being, Brown we're talking about, yes, right? Her being the elections chief, it, it, it has caused pause with many. And so there's talk that whether it's Deidre Henderson or whoever else anyone picks, these delegates are actually going to scrutinize these candidates for that spot. And if they don't get the... If they don't get the approval of the of the delegates, they would not be the nominee out of the party, at least a party nominee. Let's say so yeah. theoretically. Let's say that Cox. But that got, doesn't mean anything, right? He, Cox could he still can still run do with it because he got signatures and he yeah. can still have her. But if he gets out of the out of the primary or out of the, I'm sorry, out of the convention, he's what's considered a a, a party nominee, not just a signature gathering yeah. qualifying nominee. But if his lieutenant governor doesn't get approved then he would just be the signature qualifying nominee, not the party So nominee. I suspect that won't happen, but man, that's interesting. It is. I, I was politics. really surprised to see it. And it was, and it's, I don't rem- I had, people have told me that this is something that's always happened. I don't, I don't have any, and I've been to a ton of conventions. I don't remember it, but apparently it does, but it's just been more of a, a, a standard Yes, it hasn't but been. But it feels less deal. standard but because this, some people have. There's been a concerned. little bit more buzz on this one, yes. Okay. Uh, also, watching the Utah Senate race, and we know that we have three guaranteed candidates in this race already, but the question is are we going to get a fourth out of there, or are we going to stick with the three that have their signatures? Which um, we should note at last looking, I think that um, Hatch, Brent Oren Hatch, did not get his signatures. Unless they're still counting, he was at 21,000 of the 28,000 needed. Walton, Curtis, and Wilton had them. Do we think there's going to be a fourth candidate, or will one of those be the choice so by the delegates? Do you want to go first? I I don't want to just keep dominating. I know. Let Mara talk seriously. Please. Show some respect. You have a following on this pro on this <laughs> podcast. I don't want to get on the wrong side. I, right? More I, than I already am. I suspect the three that have gathered are the three that will come out only because of a volume sport. I mean, it gets really hard to muster 40 and not be one of those three, I think. Now, Brent Orrin Hatch, if there was someone to do it, I think it would be him. Uh, the, the, the big challenge, and you know, I, I'll say Greg and I were talking about this before, is if you have, let's say, five or six competitive ones, you start to ask the question, who's competing against each other? Right? Who's competing against yes. each other for the micro cuts that that are all that you talk about yeah. when you have nine candidates? So the question is who takes away from Curtis, I think, and who's taking away from the other the other big guys. Um, Brent Orrin Hatch is coming in second. I mean, and if you if you look at the polling results, so maybe he does make it over the line, but I think enough of, I think he and Curtis compete against so each other. So is it still name ID? Because we do have some new numbers we're going to go over that we just got hot off the press as we were coming in here. But I still feel like a lot of people don't know anything about him. So has he be doing a good job calling and talking to delegates and getting his message out there? Or is this really just living off of uh, the last breath of his father? You know, Greg, I feel like it's name I did. Greg will know this more, but I feel like um, Hatch's help from outside packs has done a really good job with the general public. And the challenge I have is this isn't a general public election, right? Yeah. I mean, I always worry if I'm I'm not a Republican delegate, and when I'm seeing your stuff too much, your targeting isn't tight enough. It's his his race has really surprised me. I didn't I I, I couldn't I still don't get it really. You're the maverick outsider 
whose dad is Orrin Hatch. And so you're making sure you're connecting the dots of Orrin Hatch, but you're, you're really, if you listen to his commercials or see his mail, he's really running as the outsider that wants to take on the swamp and everything else. Outsider, insider. So it, it just, yeah, it just seems to have a cross signal to it. But, but when you look at the polls, uh, he's strong in a primary of likely voters. I don't think he gets out of the convention. I don't think he has the, the, the delegate support to get out. So if he doesn't get com- signatures or if his signatures that he's turned in aren't enough to qualify him, I don't think he, his campaign goes on beyond Saturday. And then Trent Staggs, he's had some real high, prolific. He's been in the race the longest. High-profile conservatives. Charlie Kirk just came to town. Vivek Ramaswamy just endorsed uh, Trent Staggs. He is, right now, he's a very popular non-signature gathering candidate. He's the first that came out, as you mentioned, against uh, Romney. He's got some issues. I mean, I don't, I, no one really saw this, this brand of him, this conservative MAGA guy, before he announced his race. He actually is the mayor of Riverton and running for Salt Lake County mayor. He ran more as a moderate, so he's had different faces at different times. You have uh, Carolyn Fippen, who was a staffer in the House when I was Speaker and also staffer for Mike Lee. Very strong, running a strong race. I don't think those two are one and two coming out of the convention. I, but maybe they are because you never know because you get second place votes as people drop off. But if you had two non-signature gathering candidates that somehow theoretically got out of the convention and you had three signature uh, gathering signatures, you have five candidates for Senate at the end of June in that primary, which – dilutes the vote so much in which terms is of interesting yeah because as we talked about as mara said that i mean these races are ultimately going to get decided june 25th not that we're saying that democrats don't have a chance maybe if they come up with some really great candidates they will but it's likely going to be decided june 25th which is not very far away right. and not that long to get your Mm-mm. message out there so um we do have a new poll out here that we all have in our hot and Pause here. Utah Public Opinion Pulse uh, just came out a couple hours ago. It has John Curtis in the U.S. Senate race with 27% of the vote. Brent Hatch at 11%. Brad Wilson at 10%. Tread Staggs at 5 Jason Walton, who is going to be on the ballot, has the signatures. 2%. Carolyn Fippen, 1%. And then someone else, 3%. And then still 41% say they're unsure of who they're going to vote for. So um, interesting numbers. It's obviously good news for John Curtis. Uh, not great news, though, when you still think that there's 41% who say, I'm not sure yet. I need to hear more. What'll be interesting is who of this group started to move to their primary strategy three and four weeks ago? Like you knew a month ago. Mm-hmm. You were going into a primary, right? Yes. I mean, like, it was a matter of who is going into the primary. So there was a tight group that didn't go for signatures, and they are clearly locked and loaded on, you know, the uh, approximately 1,000, just over 1,000 delegates that they would have to talk to. You wonder who else. I mean, to be, I don't know this, but if I were John Curtis's team, I would have started cr- to creep to the primary three or four weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and, and not even met with delegates? No, no, no. I would have gone through the... the I would have gone through the process, but I would have yeah. I would have started targeting mainstream media. Or by mainstream, I mean you. As Greg well said, you don't you're not guessing who your delegate vote is. Mm-mm. You have a list of their names. names. So I would yeah. have moved beyond the list of names with mass media, paid media, because you can do both. You can talk to the delegates. Your candidate can spend your time talking to the delegates while your campaign could start on mass media. So if I were a Brad Wilson and if I were um, a Curtis or a Walton, I would have pivoted my media a few weeks ago. So if I were to, I don't know who's really committed to that. I haven't seen the numbers or or the buys, but I have seen commercials from John Curtis. I have seen commercials from uh, Brad Wilson. I have heard a lot of radio commercials from Brent Hatch. Um, Walton's been Walton, advertising. I Walton's see, been aver- I I've Walton's. been told he has, but I haven't seen it myself. But I'm just saying. Oh, that, bad so news for him. I see him a lot. You see Walton? Yeah. Okay. I've seen so, him quite a bit. so I think you have. I I think of the signature gathering candidates. They are. They have begun that to some degree, but you, your runway's so short. I think that the more the more candidates that are in this race, and if all those candidates have, and I would say that Curtis uh, Hatch, or I'm sorry, Curtis Brad Wilson and uh, Walton have the resources to either self-fund and or raise to have millions of dollars spent in, in media buys and digital buys to help the, get their name out between now and a primary. And so that makes every one of them inherently viable to win. Then you look at, well, who pulls from what demographics? I, if I were to handicap this, I'd say John Curtis has a great base in Utah County. 
Uh, they know him there. He is a gifted speaker. One of the reasons why John he Curtis is. should not ignore a, a, a convention is because he can really communicate in a compelling way. I mean, it's there's there's a lot of talk that he's way I'm more moderate. I'm going to take your word for that because somehow of all the congressional yeah, members yeah. In, here in Utah, I interview all of them on a regular yeah. basis, but not him. He's not great at reaching out to the media. I, I'll give him a Well, I'll tell you what. It, I am, I'm surprised to hear that because when he's on the stump, and I've, I was at the Davis County Convention, and when I was listening to him, he had microphone problems, and he was really ma- able to make a funny joke about it and mm-hmm. keep the crowd going. The, and why that actually is impressive for him is that the rub on him by many is that he grabs these Democrat issues like climate and that his votes look more moderated, but he really advertises himself as CPAC. I'm a 91%. I'm the most conservative. I think that it's hard to disagree with him when you're listening to him or what, and, and he's, and he's genuine. He comes across genuine. So I think that, that Provo residents, uh, Utah County residents don't buy that he's moderate. That gives him a great base in a, in a primary and then you've got two other candidates that are going to have a serious amount of resources to make their case, um, but they might be competing against each other. If Brent Orrin Hatch got out of that, out of the convention and into a primary and had that money, he could pull from a John uh, Curtis base, uh, John Curtis vote, more so than the other two would. Here's the other bad news for um, the primary listeners: is that up until now traditionally you introduce yourself and you're starting to introduce your brand where are you on the spectrum what are you what what are you starting to make your mark on now what we're going to see is negative does produce the vote (laughs) and so between now and the june primary we are going to start to see not only these candidates say here's why i'm the best you're going to see pack money and candidate money say here's also why he stinks and if trent stags gets out um, he's shown the ability to have some national conservative visitors, like he had um, uh, Matt Gates here. Yeah, he's had I mean, quite a few. Had, so there might be some. There's that that might amount to conservative money. That Stags could come getting into the out race. though is him hitting, you know, a double and a, a walk he's off actually, home run when on, we're done. Nothing, ma- nothing really matters in the first round with so many. So it doesn't really yeah. matter who's in first place in the first round because second round votes. Who you would pick second starts to really matter in a crowded race. But if you were just to take the first round and you only had one round, he has the. I've heard that he has, that he has the highest mm-hmm. ID delegates. I think, he's had, I think anyone, I think, I think it's hard to get out with the delegates tomorrow, just because I think that Curtis and Wilson and Walton have done enough to deny those folks. Is that, well, if you if you don't have a, a sign, if you don't have a, a convention only candidate get out, then yeah. you will have three to choose yeah. from, not right. four, no, which the, yeah. I'm going to tell you, the more plurality you have in a race, the lower the percentage of the Republican nominee in the red st- of state of Utah, which I don't think is necessarily fair. I don't know that 28% of Republican vote ought to be the nominee the that factor. goes into November and doesn't have a strong so race. I think it so. should be like the highest vote getter of that round. And that would be the Democrat. Cause I think, you know, they'll do well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'm, I think it's time for a runoff uh, cycle in these elections. I think I oh, think plurality is crushing us. I really do. I think it's. A, I don't. I'm. So how would you make this work? If it, if I could be king for a day, I would after this primary, I would take the top two and I would have a head to head. I think a head to head race. I think John Curtis's race here as a for U.S. Senate would be day and night different if it was one versus another person, whether it be Walton, Brad Wilson, um, or any of the. I just think if you have one to contrast from the other. That's a harder race than when you start to put the plurality in there, and and then then your base matters and who's I, which matters. I, I think if you go harder. way back when and go back to the gubernatorial race you were a part of, not the mm-hmm. congressional race, the gubernatorial race yes. where you saw the vote really spread out with all the candidates. I think that was one where people were like, "Oh wait, can we, you know, narrow it down?" Yep. I yep. agree with Greg in that respect too. That I think it gets you closer to a four vote. Uh, I'm voting for somebody yes. as opposed to gaming it. Yeah, in in your plurality votes, there's a lot of protest votes inside yeah, there. Exactly. So there's yeah. some people that say I I have to I want to vote for the most viable person that won't let this person win. So I'm going to go here. Yeah. It might not be their person of choice. And so get the plurality's got to be. And interestingly enough, when I was in the house and I was the whip and we were negotiating the the whole signature path process, um, all sides agreed that plurality wasn't the landing spot. Nobody wanted plurality. No one. 
It, yeah, no one thought it was a, a good way to go. Yeah. So we, they got to change it. And with Curtis leaving, um, whether he's talking to delegates too about who he'd like to fill his seat, that's going to be an interesting race. We know that we have at least three candidates um, that have the signatures need to be on the ballot. Any idea that we might get a fourth or fifth candidate out of this, or do we think we're going to stick with the three we've got, which is Bird, Dougal, Lawrence? Oh, wait, yeah, there's four candidates. Bird, Dougal, Lawrence, and Pay all got signatures, so that's four candidates that are good to go on the ballot. I'm excited about this round because I think we don't know who's coming out. I think you Mike think Kennedy you know? can come out of this race and, and make it the fifth. I do. I think he's popular with delegates. Who wins this race? Who wins it in for yeah. in the in the primary? Yeah. Let's just talk primary. Let's just talk convention. It's okay. tomorrow. Okay. We'll <laughs> wait and see what happens. <laughs> okay. I know. It's and a and harder it's one. short. When we're yeah. looking at the dates, that's two months till yeah. voters have to start digging in and understanding what's going on. And honestly, my brain, I love politics. I'm in it, so I'm paying attention. But I've already got the senior brain where I don't care if my child gets up and goes to school exactly. on time. <laughs> School's almost out. Summer's almost here. So this is a hard time to capture voters and make them concentrate and think so oh, you sound crazy i mean again best thing that'll happen to the convention is the weather tomorrow yeah because if it's nice trying to get people's attention in june you just you it's so, not the time i know it i'm planning my barbecue for the fourth of july who's yeah. coming what am i making primaries in utah used to be in september yeah uh, should we go we've, back to that and we've had august we've had september primaries we've had august primaries are searching for just the right moment has been. I can see the reasons for both, but September, I feel like everyone's more locked and loaded because right now we're at the, am I packing anything other than a Twinkie for my kids' lunch? Yeah. You don't care. But once your kids are back in the middle to end of August, I feel like everyone's like, oh, yay, I'm getting up early. I'm going to read. I'm going to watch the news. I'm back in my habits. I'm a great mom. So I'm a great dad. So wouldn't that be the time to have a primary? I think so. Yeah. I, I, they didn't like it because we were... Every, Parties were beating each other up until literally what? So it's like a bloodbath till the end. Yeah, the, there was know, also expense arguments. A, but yeah, it, I mean, like, like, um, who was it? Um, Wayne, who was it? Who was the who? When the, in ninety two in the Senate race, the popular Democrat member of Congress that ran Wayne Owens. Wayne Owens runs, but it really wasn't a race because Joe Cannon and Bob Bennett had such a high profile expensive senate remember primary. they were close they were 3 million up on both of their races which was unheard yes, of at the it time it was and so there was no oxygen in the room once the primary was vote was decided Wayne Owens he couldn't get on anyone's radar and i think that's that's remember one of the also ideas too of, we were playing with the national um relevance to the presidential in a different way then yeah that's right. and i think we've settled or maybe we've whatever we've done with the presidential and we've so awesome you know, on it could yeah. you lead that to switch it back to september could you I, do that I would, actually i would love it because you know what you could do then you can go back to these state uh, these two-day state conventions where you get longer presentations i mean oh my joe that cannon had lee greenwood that horrible Joe Cannon had Lee Greenwood saying proud to be an american at his on his Ooh, that stage nice, thing though. i mean mm -hmm. they, you had real elephants at the convention, a guy brought an elephant, one of the candidates, a, a big elephant. It's the pageantry of a convention, two-day convention. Oh, my gosh. It was so much fun. That sounds sort I of I was sexy. 21. I was 22. I loved it. But I thought, I thought those conventions were something else. They I were really good did. times. All right. And then it becomes a popularity contest of who can bring the coolest, you know, do you have a bald eagle? What kind of snacks are you giving out? Interesting. Snacks, I think, are critical. Snacks yeah. are definitely I critical. I think snacks are still critical. Yeah, I love snacks. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Congress. Uh, they've been busy and not busy all at the same time. They finally passed the $95 billion aid bills uh, for Ukraine, Israel, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Senator Mike Lee, if you've been on social media, has been lobbying hard against it. Senator Mitt Romney voted in favor. And one of the things I hate that Congress does is when they just stick something non-related in their bill and pass it too. But they added on the TikTok ban. So that means that TikTok has exactly a year from now, the clock is ticking for them to find a U.S. buyer or all of the home influencers who are doing their makeup and telling you about their lives or trying on cool outfits or whatever you do to influence on TikTok are going to have to find another way to make millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> um, what do we think of the votes here? Uh, good that it passed, bad that it passed. What does it mean? Mike Johnson, some people said that he did a great job splitting them up and getting them through. Others were like, let's fire him. Let's find someone new. So unequivocally, I just want to say, well done, Mike Johnson, with no qualifiers there. Like, finally, he just did. I, 
agree with him, disagree. I felt like he did what he thought was the best thing. And, and to be as in the speaker position that he's in, where he's constantly being threatened, to finally just say, you know what, I did what I thought was the right thing to do. I really appreciate it. I think this is old school participation in world politics. So trying to reframe it as somehow sort of a liberal version of America, this is like the most traditional version of America to help with people fighting for democracy. So Mike John and one of our closest allies. No, I mean, he's not even close. What I liked about it is I'm saying that vote wasn't left or right. I think that vote was so traditionally American foreign policy Uh, that I appreciated it. So what I think is, is wrong to do if you have the majority is to take a minority of your majority and team up with the minority party to pass something. I, I just think it's bad form. I would say when Matt Gates does it to remove McCarthy, uh, with a number of Republicans teaming with all the Democrats to remove McCarthy, I think it is poor form or worse. But I think in this bill as well, when you only had, you had less than 100 Republicans in the House vote for this bill and, and really deliver it on the backs of all the minority Democrats in the House, that's not what a speaker is supposed to do. That's not his job. Um, I, I don't know this why. A I think narrow it was, bit, though. I Craig. think it is so. It is. It is. It is dizzying to me that you we can't get one thing done on that southern border, which was Speaker Johnson's. Hey, we've got a border issue here. We got four million people coming across every year. We don't know where they are. They're coming from around the world, by the way. Um, if the, we have national security issues, if we have all of these other issues that people say are happening, you can't tell me the physical presence, the unabated walking across and coming into this country cannot be on the same level of national security. It is insane that there is nothing about this border in any of this hundred billion dollars that they passed. It is, I'll never take, if I were in that Congress, I would never take serious a FISA warrant or a, or any foreign war. If you can't tell me that that, that, that Southern border doesn't pose a risk. If you can't say that, then we're, then we don't have a real conversation because it is real. It so is if they a can real tack on TikTok, issue. you wanted the U.S. Border I want. I want. The, you've got to do something with this board. This border, and we haven't even begun to see it because they get three and four year court dates that they're not even. They haven't not shown up for yet to be on the wrong side of it, and it's going to grow and grow and grow over the years to come. Something has to be done there, and for it to be ignored, and that's what it was. It was ignored. It's to me, it's unserious, and now, I wouldn't. I would not have played ball. And what I think is unserious that. is any elected official that says I'm here for one issue and one issue only, and I don't care about anything else. I, I didn't don't care say about that. any other. I budget. didn't say that. You said you should not deal with anything until you deal with the border. It's, it's That's connected. the most ridiculous so, position. No, no, no. I mean, like you Craig, can't tell me there's a there's a national security issue without talking about your border. And if you do, Ukraine then you're, then you're not an honest broker. National security issue. Uh, Ukraine Putin is taking just, over Poland's not a national security issue. It's a it's a foreign policy issue. It's but it, it, I, I'm just telling you, yeah. we ha- I think America can walk and chew gum. I think America has huge capacity. And this hostage taking saying I. I won't vote for. I'm not anything talking some random unless you deal unrelated with this bill that the I want to see passed. It, it is it is national security. Republicans the closest been, to home. Republicans have been as poor on immigration. They're equal opportunity offenders on this issue. You didn't hear me so, say Republican. I'm saying I would not play ball yeah, on that deal unless you got serious about real issues. And that one is not unrelated. To national security. I think it's not a serious assertion to say I won't have a discussion unless you talk about the only thing I want to talk about. You are framing first. that like I'm picking some esoteric issue and saying you have to do this before you do all of it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is no national security issue if you can't take the one that is Rick, impacting no, our there's country no immediately. Bill. There's no bill. There's no consensus on immigration. Well, there's nothing to vote you know what? on. Find the urgency that they found for FISA. Find the urgency they found for for Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. Find the same urgency. I why why can't they? The clarity of America defending democracy on multiple fronts. Yeah. I am Without shocked our own that Republicans aren't appreciative of that. Well, I can I tell mean, you I think that it if shows you live where in a the MAGA state, conservatives are no. not really looking if you at live, policy This is at why all. I don't think Is it Democrat, an issue of money partially at this point when we're looking at the bottom line no, of how much No, the money issue of money need. are the huge programs we do. I mean, like, I will be... Like, so you're, you're talking about you're Social talking, Securities, Medicaid, I mean, Medicare. if we're really going to get serious about our... I, I do think we have a deficit problem. We all think 
think we have, we're living off of credit cards. But this is not fair to say that this is the tipping point. Let me America. let me ask you this. Chicago just now I just read this. Chicago has a hundred and fifty million dollars in their city budget to handle the refugees or the immigrants, the illegal immigrants that are coming in, and they just the mayor just asked for seventy five million more and their city council's approving it. To the outrage and the protests of the people of Chicago who are not Republicans, okay? There, it is a war zone. The homicide rate in that city is reprehensible. You're putting two, uh, 200 and what, 225, what, yeah, $225 million to this border issue in Chicago to the detriment of the people that live in Chicago, and we can't have that be a, a front burner issue. But we, my objection we have to, be, to you we, is that's, that's the question at hand was that should we, we can't support handle Israel? It? The question at hand was to support Israel, yeah. and you say Get, I can't have that Israeli yeah, conversation. If my, if until my you house can wrap is around. coming in, I got to bolster these right. walls before so I, I can worry about what's happening across the street. I don't know why you're street. objecting to me telling you that I no, you don't think you can do anything without dealing with immigration. Usually, this is guns or abortion that gets you guys going. I know this one. I'm just fired. Reasonable. I'm telling you, this Democrat Party wouldn't even survive if the Republicans weren't propping it up at the moment. They they are alienating. If they have a Democrat in a border state that's still voting for them, they're lucky because the Democrats could care less about the livelihoods and the public safety of anyone that lives on a border state. Now you go to New York where they're kicking the kids out of the school Greg, gyms you knew, so they can accommodate these If you knew these, anything these, about immigration, immigra- you would know that the second they hit those border states, uh, they go inland. Immigration is an in, is I a 50-state problem. I know the NGOs are problem. delivering them everywhere. I know I mean, it's, it's starting it's to be fed. 50 state problem, but what I think the real problem is, you can't have a foreign policy discussion without putting something else there. And I'm just saying, the they move them across the country. Promise you, the people that live across that border are are feeling it worse. Promise you, we're illustrating why we're not getting anywhere because I'm having a foreign policy discussion, and you say no, I can't have a foreign foreign policy discussion unless you talk about what I want to talk about. You can't, you yeah, it's priorities, and you it's myopic or it's selective logic to say you can't have an immigration strategy if it's so important to MAGA and He was you. trying to do it for four years and the Democrats oh, stopped him. Hell, he's really unsuccessful Have you seen the illegal that? entries when he was president versus what we have today? You can't say he illegal doesn't have a plan. Illegal entries are, are like one component of an entire It's the whole component. Issue. They're not even considering oh, those illegal gosh. anymore. They're okay. letting they're letting them be right. civilly detained if they come over illegally what now. What we it's need a new is Congress to solve the whole problem. What um, I think that President Trump did through executive order and Biden then undid was slowing the flow at the border. But if we really want to fix this, Congress has to figure out out uh, what to do about all the DACA students. They have to figure out once you're here how to get people through the court process. There are a lot of things that have to be figured out. I think that Romney talks about, you know, the work um, E-Verify. So I think there's a lot of pieces of it. And I believe if they sat down at a table, they could figure it out. But no one wants to give someone else the win. They always want to point fingers. So will this ever get solved? I don't know. I agree. But I do think I'm going to go back to the point where Mike Johnson did a great job. <laughs> and it was important that we fund no, it. Because I, I think this destructive You and the New York Times think he did political, a good job is the tell. You and the, the destructive actions of never being able to talk about things unless you have your issues Again, talked about you're acting first. like those are random issues I'm trying to join right. together. Well, luckily, they are. you guys have a First Amendment right, are. which I want to talk about, <laughs> because there are a lot of college students who have given up on college right now, yeah. protesting across the country, um, looking at the funding that's going to Israel, not happy. Uh, they're protesting and saying they stand up for Palestinians and uh, the deaths that are happening there on their side. Uh, interestingly enough, Hamas, I don't know if that's who you want to come out and say high five, great job, has come out with a statement and said, uh, great job protesting. It's interesting watching all of these universities where it happened because it kind of started in the Northeast and it spread, I think, really across the country, some of these protests. You see how they deal with it in Texas where uh, the sheriff's office is coming in there, rounding people up, telling them to go do something else better with their time, kicking them out, making arrests. And then you look in New York City where they're making them sack lunches and they're camping out in the grasses. So definitely uh, two different ways of looking at it. And then Mara throws in this interesting piece from Axios that I've never seen saying, hey, have you thought about the fact that no one, or at least not no one, there's not very many people here in Utah, and especially on college campuses, uh, joining in what is a national movement at this point. So Yeah, so first to the, the national movements, I talked to a News Nation reporter this morning who had been to several campuses, and today was back at Columbia's campus. Columbia was sort of they the, were the start, the start mm-hmm. of this. Yes. And her perspective, having visited o- the Ohio State, she had visited several campuses. Her perspective is that, by and large, both sides are showing up. I'm not going to – we won't worry about – 
describing both sides. I think our listeners know both sides are showing up and, and her impression was that by and large there, they were going well as peaceful demonstrations. And then you have sort of this small group of onesies, twosies who are being very um, disruptive and divisive. But she really felt having visited several college campuses that they were going pretty well. Now, what seems to mark against that is that USC decided of their own accord that they were worried about it enough to one week ahead um, cancel. Canceled now remember, commencement. they also uh, they also canceled their valedictorian speech as well. But then I did see a couple days ago, Axios Utah, so this was the Utah one, did a really interesting article in which they talked to a local organizer as well as a national um, organization that has been doing civil unrest for years and years. And they talked about how in Utah, we have such a culture of respecting authority and such a culture of sort of being polite and getting along and that they had felt through their research. And and we have a couple of interesting things on BYU, rightly so, as a private university. And so they can restrict and have restricted these gatherings a little more. But um, the other state schools also have some restrictions, but we're not seeing them pushed. They pointed out that when we see these protests they usually happen by marching up to the capitol they don't tend to happen like in the quad yeah and the supposition was kids are playing frisbee on the quads here in utah they say and one was our this sort of reverence for authority but two that we saw civil disobedience more as a criminal activity as opposed to a civil disobedience Uh, issue and that (laughs) this is shocking and that we that our culture was sort of not okay with this being how we do it. I thought it was an interesting point, but then when you look back to the protests from George Floyd and Black Lives Matter when they happened, I mean, there were a a lot of young people, I'm assuming university students, who were uh, protesting, and some of them violently, in downtown Salt Lake City. And so I don't know that they never protest, but at the same time, I think sometimes when I've done political stories and I've gone up to talk to whether it's like young Democrats or Republicans, I've found it hard on our campuses BYU is a little different. I think they're more political. I have found had a hard time finding young people who were interested in the political process, wanted to talk about it, and invested. Yeah. So why we're not protesting, I don't know. I do. Um, I okay. know. Tell me why. Because our kids aren't anti-Semitic, and they're not pro-terrorists. That's why. Because well, I'm telling you. are talking about all protests, no, I'm talk- Well, I'm talking about this the article. What, was, what inspired that article is they're not seeing the kind of unrest or not seeing what's happening on our Utah campuses like you're seeing in others. So I went back to New York City last Friday to take my son to a, a great fight. But I got trapped in a chair, you know, from here, from Salt Lake to JFK on a, on a plane where I got to watch the news for four straight hours where I'm never, I'm never sitting still that long. And, it's, and they're covering this whole Columbia thing, and I'm watching this for a good portion of time, uh, more than I normally do. And I am sorry when they are yelling, we are Hamas. It's not one day you know, the June, the October 6th or whatever, 7th, whatever day. It's not two days. It's not 100 days. It's not 1,000 days. It's 10,000 days. We are Hamas. The the things that are being screamed and yelled at, they, you know, they told the kid, the Jewish kid, the, the kids that are Jewish at these schools, these poor kids, they're like, don't come to class. Don't run for the hills. We can't protect you. This, this professor in Columbia who's from Israel who wanted to counter protest, they turned his access badge off be- and would not let him go and, and, and have his thoughtful and and conscientious objection to what was being said it is not one it's not two sided it's not two you know kids really drilling into some real deep issues here it is all filled with hate it is it is reprehensible and i'm so glad that we're not seeing that on our campuses here i think we brought these kids up better than that this this is not uh, anybody that's that's trying to defend hamas right now it, it is a leap of logic if if you just go back to the the 2020 race I somehow, as a Republican, if there was a neo-Nazi or a anti, uh, some white supremacist, it was the equivalent of a Republican. I might have never, never met one. I've never been around him. I don't know who QAnon is, but that's who I am. How in the world this pro-terrorist sentiment that's spreading across this country and Jewish people being treated so poorly in this country is not laid at the feet of a Schumer who's going after Netanyahu, telling him to unilaterally uh, you know, cease fire, uh, same with uh, Bernie Sanders, Amar Oman or whatever her name is, her daughter is one of the protesters. You can go to the very feet of the Democrat members of Congress where this hate is being spewed. Why are we not talking about it the way the Democrats talked about how every Republican was a neo-Nazi? 
Oh, it was just a bright, it was all tiki torches, remember? Uh, Anti-Semitism was tiki torches and khaki pants. Now, you look at what's going on here, it's, it's, this is real. This, that stuff, that was just, uh, that was pageantry. I watched this, and I watched it on that plane, and I could not believe what I was seeing. And I'm just so great. I got a kid at USU. I'm so glad we're not seeing this, this madness in that campus. Is your criticism of uh, Schumer anti-Semitic? Oh, no. I just want to be yeah, clear. I, mean, I am. I want to be I clear. I am. You I think, think he's. I think he is challenging he, Netanyahu's ability. You think that Jewish American? Yes, is, absolutely. Is, I think. I think anyone who's telling Israel right now to lay down and stop trying to find those hostages or not stop until they turn so, those hostages over, Greg, they are playing to the, the enemy's side. One of the areas that we always disagree on is I think you're reductive. I think it's true. If anyone is <laughs> supporting Hamas, that's a problem. But I do. And think they are, there's, Mara. I think there's they room are. to support Palestinians and not support Hamas. They're they're so, not even hey, drawing that. Let you go. Sorry. So I, if anyone is supporting Hamas, I, I think there are very few sensible people who agree with supporting terrorism. I don't think there's very many people who agree that Hamas is doing the right thing. But I think it's a bit too reductive to just say that every student who is protesting in America is feeling that way. I appreciate always when when Americans, it's so fundamental, the right to protest. I also think so it, I am going to adjust slightly to the answer to the question being Utah exceptionalism. I mean, I appreciate that we're swell, but that is just so like, why don't we do it? because we're exceptional? No. I mean, you have to question in America. Are they dumb? Do they not care? No, is that for what you're me, saying? I think the deeper issue is that in Utah, we're not having hard discussions. And in a, and in But the good news is we're not yelling at each other. The, in, a, in the United States, I think what MAGA has shown and I think what the far left has shown is there's this pent-up anger that we have to figure out how to have a discussion about. The, now, I think this issue has brought it to light, but I think more and more issues are saying, look at us as Americans who can't even argue well. We can't disagree with each other right now in a civil, non-hateful way. The, the tense tone you hear from me is that the reductiveness of this entire episode about Hamas or about Palestinians or whatever you want to call them is that the Jewish kids are told in colleges to go home. We used to have fainting couches, okay, and safe right. spaces. I mean, these Middle kids Eastern are kids not allowed to kinds. go to the classroom. There's no safe place for I these mean, kids. That's been happening. What to in the Islamic world? That's not that's not a well. thoughtful debate. You're and protest. absolutely right, and it, this and, that's, is and you act like that's like one person. But it's not. It's you're a very like common thing. It's not thing. also happening to Islamic kids. That kind of behavior <laughs> is it's unacceptable. Not. It's not happening. It, it's not it happening. Is. The the the, the is, Jewish professor happened, at the at, at Columbia Asian kids had his badge COVID. turned off. The and the pa- the other ones didn't have their badges turned off. It's not okay, Greg. It's not okay when anyone is treated that way. And they're that's being treated happening, differently. That's happening to Islamic kids. No, it what? happened to Asian kids what during saying. COVID. I did. You know what I'm saying. I got there, it. You watched a news program pass, when, student, when you were at the airport. Their student passes. I got it. Their student passes that they get them through Greg, doors are turned off for the Jewish kids and are turned on for the other side. That it. is not the same. You're saying they're treated the same. No, That's not the same. I'm saying there is discrimination of all kinds of minority communities, not just one. Yeah, and it's all, all of the that same. discrimination it's all exactly the is same. bad. It's all mirrored. It's all the same. Sure. It's I, all I bad. think every kid, every Middle Eastern kid is being treated like a Jewish kid in every school right now. You just That's said an all amazing, Jewish people that's are being that's treated That's an amazing uh, thing. I don't think that there's a lot of people, if they're living through this, that would agree with you. But I'm just yeah, saying it's all that the same. any of that is unacceptable, but it is not unique to one experience. So today it is. What we need to do today is to say is. that this behavior in America, no matter who the target is of your discrimination, that behavior shouldn't be acceptable. Do you realize that Anthony Blinken said that the reason that Netanyahu and Israel are not cease, have not gone through a ceasefire is because Hamas refuses to give up the remaining hostages. So who is telling him to telling Israel to cease fire when Hamas refuses to give up the remaining hostages? I mean, the, it is irony, taking the, side the of irony of your outrage is that you wouldn't have voted to uh, fund Israelis' war because you were because no, we're not would, taking care of be, immigration. No, I mean, there's some the, irony in that. Imp- no, it would be that you make it one or the other. I'm saying it's the impetus is you get it right here because you got to get it right there. You put it together. That's what you do with legislation. Yeah, what so, I'd like to see is if we could microchip everyone. Again, bad idea. But I'd love <laughs> to see how many people who protest on either side, yeah. any side, take their frustrations or whatever they're talking about and show up 
at Congress or show up and vote or show up at a city council meeting or wherever is going to make the difference? Do they simply protest or they do something about it? And do they vote and how do they and vote? And they simply protest. Yes. My criticism is, and I'll be candid about my criticism of youth, is that... Um, you know, when we talk about activism, they're speaking truth to power, and there's something to that. But that's not change. Change is showing up on Tuesday night at 7.30 and engaging in your county council. That. And so I do think in America we're more inclined to say, well, I signed the petition and 153 people say that Greg is stupid, and then I liked it <laughs> on Instagram. Why was that your example? Well, I, I mean, understand. clearly there'd be more than 153. But <laughs> like, yeah. like uh, that these, to your point, this isn't itself and speaking truth to power has something to it it elevates issues i'm speaking generally not specifically so but i do think sometimes we confuse that with participation and making the world look like you want it to and that i think happens at city council meetings it happens doing public service it happens voting i would love to know how many of these protesters are also voting that's what i really want to know and that's why i wanted to microchip them to follow and see mm -hmm. but i guess when you vote at home you wouldn't know because you could follow them and see if they actually We'd voted or it drop it off we'd get TikTok. but yeah on so it. that's my thing because I, I think that's one thing maybe growing up in utah going back to the axios article i don't know what i would have turned out to be an adult um, because i am what i am and as someone in the media you don't go protest or march with something you you know are unbiased in it but I look at the way I was raised and the way I was raised seems to be the way a lot of my friends were which doesn't mean it was true for everyone but my parents were the kind of people where if it was a problem or you were bored go find something to do get a job make some money uh make a difference, show up mm -hmm. that meeting, go vote. And these were all things where they taught us to go figure out and do things. But I don't think there was ever the encouragement, not that they were against First Amendment rights and protesting, but that was never what they'd be like, hey, solve your problem this way. They were just like, well, do something about it. And what are you going to do to help yourself? And so there might be a lot of that sentiment in the state where people are like, okay, it's not that my heart's not with these people I see on TV, but I'm going to go pay the bills and I'm going to show up at this meeting or, you know, make a change in a way that I think we can. have a history of protesting here. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a ton. Express ourselves. I'm going to tell you right now, this, this, this issue has transcended any politics. When you have, when you have uh, John Fetterman from Pennsylvania and he is defending Israel and defending their right to defend themselves and he is being protested outside of his home in Pittsburgh, he's, all of this is going on. This is not a Republican versus Democrat thing. I don't think that people who, they're calling them Zionists, whether they're Jewish, whatever you want to say, they are not given as good as they're getting. They're getting way, way, way worse. And I don't think there's any moral justification. You cannot create a moral equivalency to how everyone's being treated and it's just what side you're on, what your view is. I think that there is anti-Semitism that is growing in this country that blows my mind. That I cannot believe I I'm watching. I do find it interesting, though, that you feel like I'm disagreeing with you. And you are. You just down. did. You just I'm did. Not. You said that. I'm, I just that think there's a large enough capacity to 100% agree with what you just said and then go beyond that community <laughs> okay. and go to others. I don't think it's an either or. I wasn't trying to minimize the I'm not talking about eternal terms. Role. I'm talking about the current events going on right now. Is right. what I'm really upset and, about. And Isra Israelis and the Jewish community yeah. are concerned about Palestinian citizens. I yes. don't think you can't we are. only have the capacity to care about one group. No, that I, was my point. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I there is a level of that. hate in the First Amendment rights to the speech that we're seeing going on <laughs> that makes me because I love that people have the right to go and protest and, and be make horrible. their voice heard. <laughs> but I but the hate you hear coming out and yeah, it, it makes me sick that this is where our country is at and. It's terrible. I would like the conversation to happen. I would like us to be able to fight it out. I never want to lose those First Amendment rights, but it is a little scary watching. I think uh, this is all going to have a pull as we're looking closer to the presidential election. I think President Biden, some of his you know younger voters who might automatically be on his side are not going to be on his side. That's why I'm hoping that they show up and actually debate. So, yeah, it'll be interesting he, to see Biden what happens. Biden said today he would debate. He did? I missed did that. Did he really? Yeah. Breaking I'm so news. Happy. Yeah, All right. Could today. you text Trump and see if he can commit Could to you get his? Yeah, we'll I would get, really like to see it happen. Donald on it. Yeah. Well, I'd like to fight more, but uh, we all have other things <laughs> that we have to do. Camera make us just Donald. more edgy I here. What was so. going really on? Today. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, seriously. I, I, you're super. Yeah. Did you caffeinate? Are you? No, I haven't had. Actually, I'm actually low on caffeine. I usually have your Red Bull. You're starting. Really low on it. Your your pre gaming convention. You came in. I think so. You came in here pre game. I I am I am worked up on a on a on a bunch of different levels. 
I'm not going to be there because I have a track meet in the rain. I'm going to go sit at because I'm in a mom hard. But I would um, like you to text us updates, like if there's any like yeah. good little tidbits so we can know what's going on. So we're going to watch it closely. Yeah. I think tomorrow is going to be an amazing day. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, exciting results. If you're headed to convention, good luck, Godspeed. Are you an actual delegate? I'm not. I'm are you not. heading to the Democrat uh, convention to see how things roll? Or are you going to? Do fun things with your oh, family. Oh, no, I'm not going to. I have done my time. I have done. I've spent more time at Republican conventions than Democratic conventions. Although I have been to the national. I've been a delegate to the National Democratic Convention. I've been a Democratic delegate many times. No disrespect. But you've left Democrats that party, and I understand why now. I, it occurred to me this week that no. Mara called the shot years ago when she said she's no longer a Democrat. Now I know why. I, I think that Democrat party that you were a part of, understand you wouldn't recognize today. Is that I am more important than the parties. <laughs> And so I get to do what I want to do. No, you left that party because that party's a shell of its one self. That's what it I is. Like well, it. this I like is going to be a whole one. podcast for another day. <laughs> if you joined us for the first time on video, thanks so much for looking Good at our face. We get along, I swear. Head. It's just, you know. It's true. Greg what. and Mara fight like cats and dogs. It's usually just a couple issues. This isn't usually one of them. So I, I know. Don't know. Guns and abortion are your usual. Usually um, are well, I won't even But these two carpool anymore. together. They break bread together. They have meetings yeah. together. So don't worry about them. They'll still be friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back again again to squabble again next week.